Get my six. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back for another tale from October Nights. <clears throat> Here on Homesteading Off the Grid, the most awesome homesteading channel on the entire internet that has absolutely nothing to do with homesteading. Now, get my six, watch behind me, because I barely got here with enough daylight left to be able to read to tell the story. So this is a time when we may or may not see some really creepy things back there in the background. So this evening's story uh, is a true story. It's called Secret Admirer. It comes from October Nights, 31 Tales for the Halloween Season, Part 1. As you know, there's a Part 2 as well. Uh, we can get frightened over vampires, werewolves, Bigfoot Sasquatches, and demons, all this other stuff as much as we want. And, you know, the jury's still out on whether or not some of these things are even real. Um, but one thing that is real uh, is human beings are human beings and I think we're the most terrifying creatures on earth uh, especially when you delve into uh, such aspects or concepts as sociopathy sociopaths um, borderline personality disorders uh, <clears throat> gaslighting all these mental illnesses that whatever I'm just gonna get on with the story because we're gonna run out of daylight and it's all summed up in this story. So, Secret Admirer. Thought I heard distant laughter. Some of the most terrifying stories you'll ever hear are not the stories that have ghosts and ghouls and creepy crawlies, but stories that have real living, breathing, flesh and blood human beings. We as a species have got to be about the most terrifying creatures to walk the earth. It's like what I just said. Comes now such a story. We have to go way back to 1995 or so for this story. I was a third year college student, I'd say junior, but since it took me six years to graduate, I don't know if that would be the right term to use. And I was working my way through college by waiting tables or cooking in various restaurants. I'd had other jobs off and on throughout college, but waiting tables was the one I liked best because if you had even a halfway decent personality, and if you were halfway decent looking, you could make bank, and I did. I used to make 150 to $200 a night back in the 90s, waiting tables in college. <clears throat> I lived off campus while in college, at least after my first year, and I usually moved to a different apartment each new year, like most college students, so I used a P.O. box down at the local post office for my mail. Yes, this proves that we have to go way back to the old days for this story. No social media yet, hell no internet, really, unless you were a government or business bigwig, and we certainly didn't have cell phones. One day, as was my typical daily routine back then, I walked to the post office, which was right down the road from my apartment, and checked my mail. And then I got in my crappy old beater car, a brandy collared 1988 Chevy Celebrity, that I got somewhere for $600 the year before and headed for work. I usually didn't receive mail, which I always viewed as a good thing. No mail equaled no bills. But on this day, I had. I'd received a greeting card. The card had no return address, so of course this made me curious, and it wasn't anywhere near my birthday or any holiday. I ripped the envelope open, read the card, and discovered that I had a secret admirer. It was a quite lengthy note written in a woman's hand in which the author stated that... You hear that? We're not alone. Something's in here walking around this forest with us. So continue to get my six. <clears throat> so the author stated in this handwritten card that they loved coming to the restaurant where I worked just so she could see me. She went on and on about how handsome I was and how she liked the way I moved, yada, yada, yada. I was 22 years old at the time. So number one, I was flattered. And number two, I envisioned in my mind's eye that 
My secret admirer was my age or thereabouts, and that she was smoking hot, of course. I was excited and couldn't wait to find out who she was. <clears throat> that evening at work, I made sure to give an extra smile to every pretty girl in my age group that came in. I guess I pissed off a lot of husbands and boyfriends, but I was so excited about finding out who my secret admirer was that I didn't really care. A week went by during which my secret admirer did not reveal herself, and then another greeting card came. This one wasn't so flattering. As it turned out, my secret admirer revealed a little more about herself. She claimed in her letter that she was in her late 60s and that she was a very wealthy widow. Her husband had been rich and he'd left her a fortune and she needed a good-looking young man to carry her bags around Europe for her when she went on holiday. Okay, I was creeped out this time. Remember, I was 22, so 60-something was ancient. Here I am in this story going back to the days before the internet and cell phones. Back then, at my age, I viewed someone of her age as having been born during the time of the dinosaurs, just as I'm sure millennials view me today at 46 as of this writing. I'm 49 now, I'm getting ready to turn 50. I guess this book's three years old. That night at work, I sure was looking around at the female customers again, but no longer with excitement, hoping to see the smoking hot 20-something-year-old girl who I'd hoped admired me, but fearful of seeing the 60-something-year-old grandmother who actually did. As I looked around, it seemed like all the old ladies in the place were staring at me. As I went from table to table, making eye contact with all of the older women as I passed, they all returned my gaze and they all smiled politely. Looking back on it now, I know they were just being friendly, but when it was going on, I was convinced that each one of them was my secret admirer. I was so freaked out, my anxiety level so high, I felt like I had to talk to someone about it. My floor manager, Tina, approached me and she said she could tell I was anxious or worried about something, and so I decided she would be the one I'd talk with about my secret admirer. <clears throat> I filled Tina in on the cards I'd received in the mail, and she told me she understood why I seemed so nervous. She said she'd help me try to figure out who my secret admirer was, but she didn't use that term. She used the term stalker. She told me the old bat was probably crazy and that I wasn't safe. We needed to figure this thing out, and I could trust her to help me. The following week, I received another card, and this time the tone was taunting. Ha ha ha, it began. I can see that you have enlisted help in trying to figure out who I am. Good luck. I am not going to reveal myself to you now. I wanted our relationship be to be between us. Now it will be only known to me. I am still going to come into the restaurant every night and watch you while you work. Because you are so good looking, and I like the way you move. But you will never know who I, <clears throat> who I am. Okay, this took Creepy to a whole new level. Knowing what I know now, I should have gone to the police. But at the time, I was a young, bravado man, and the double standard was with this kind of thing weighed too heavily on me to do so at the time. If this were happening to a woman, everyone would expect her to report it, and her creepy stalker man would go to jail. But when this type of thing happens to a man, sadly, it's considered by too many in our society to be humorous. And if the victim seeks help, he's to be made fun of, viewed as weak. Let me tell you, nothing about being stalked by a 60-something-year-old woman was funny at all. I showed Tina my newest card, and she read it, and then she said, Oh my God, I know who it is. Who? I said. You mean you haven't figured it out? No, I said. Enlighten me. Wow, she said. I can't believe you haven't figured it out. And then she walked off and got back to work, just like that. She never enlightened me at all. And at the end of the night, I was called into the office by the manager and fired. Okay, so you're probably wondering why I was called into the office and fired, right? Had it been the boss's wife who'd really been stalking me? <clears throat> no, nothing of the sort. What the hell kind of business do you think I'm running here, the boss, Mr. Wilson said when he got me alone in his office. A whorehouse? Are you some sort of gigolo? What? I asked, completely confused. Are you whoring yourself out to these old ladies that come in here to eat, Mr. Wilson asked. He was a short man, about five feet six, and he was in his 70s, but he was rough and tough and full of grit. He was a retired Marine, and he'd fought in the Korean War. When he spoke, everyone around him stood at attention. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Wilson, I said. You're fired, he said. Why, I asked. For coming in here and trying to pick up these old ladies with money. I know all about it. You've got it backwards, I told him. I'm not trying to pick them up. They're trying to pick me up. Ah, oh, bullshit, he said. Get out of here and don't come back. At that point, he grabbed me by the elbow and liter literally threw me out of his office. I went home dejected. 
Not only had I never been fired before, but he'd gotten it all backward, and I really needed that job. I couldn't sleep that night, at least until I devised a plan on how to get my job back. I'd take all the cards I'd received from my secret admirer to the restaurant the next day before it opened, and I'd show Mr. Wilson that I was telling tr the truth. And it worked. And I found out who my secret admirer had been all along. Tina. Tina! Mr. Wilson yelled, storming out of his office after having read the cards. Tina was filling up the ketchup bottles on the tables. Get in my office. Tina and Mr. Wilson went into his office, and he slammed the door shut behind them. I heard screaming, lots and lots of screaming coming from the office, but I couldn't make out what was being said. About a minute later, Tina came out of the office crying. She marched over to the server station and grabbed her personal effects, and then she marched right out the door, never to return. Tina had sent me the cards. It never occurred to me to even think of how some random old lady had gotten my mailing address. Tina had been able to access it through the personnel files in Mr. Wilson's office. To this day, I do not know why Tina did what she did. Did she have a crush on me? Did she feel as if she were in love with me? Or was it, in the, or was it the opposite? Did she feel like she hated me? Did she view me as an arrogant college kid? Did she view me as a threat to her position as floor manager? So she was trying to scare me into quitting? I was a pretty damn good waiter. Or was Tina, as I feared was the 60-something-year-old woman she portrayed herself as being, simply and completely, definitely and totally batshit crazy? Again, I still don't know, even a quarter of a century later, as of this writing, but I think I'll put my money on the batshit crazy part. The end. So there you have it, folks, and I was right. Just enough daylight left to get through the story. Uh, so looking back on it now, I would just say that Tina um, was a sociopath. Um, yeah, she was a sociopath, and I was her target. Uh, I, I wrote the book The Lunatic a couple of years ago. People have often asked, what's the best book I've ever written? In my humble opinion, I think it's The Lunatic. Uh, if you get that one, all of my books are available on Amazon in print and or Kindle. You can get autographed print copies from our Etsy store. The links are in the description box below. Understand, if you read The Lunatic, there's a lot of, excuse me, foul language, a lot of adult situations, sexual uh, interactions. Um, but the main character is a sociopath. And uh, it, this character is based on a true life sociopath that I had the unfortunate of crossing paths with and so through my research i learned how these people work basically they view life as if they're a cat and everyone else is a mouse and they just play these games like tina did and that is an honest to god true story i w i just happened to be her mouse for that period of time of about six weeks um and she was the cat smarter than everybody Sm she's so smart everybody else is so stupid and so they will manipulate people use them take advantage gaslight them as was the case with tina because it makes them feel superior. Now, their victims uh, are not stupid. They're just being friendly. They're just being neighborly. They're just being good co-workers. Uh, they just fall prey to sociopaths. They're hard to spot, but Tina helped me spot them a little bit quicker after that. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, installment of October Nights here from the greatest homesteading channel on the internet that has absolutely nothing to do with homesteading, homesteading off the grid, and I'm getting my butt out of these woods before dark because for all I know, Tina might live right down the road from me. She might be creeping around through these woods right now. See y'all for more next time.